My name is William G. This is a sample lesson for accounting for partnerships. Let's say you have a great idea for a new business, but starting your own business can be extremely daunting. You may feel really good about developing your product, but you may be weak in accounting or marketing. On the flip side, you may know a lot about making a business a success, but you have absolutely no idea what you're trying to sell. If you like the idea of owning your own business, but you feel more comfortable sharing both the responsibility and the risk with another person, then a partnership may be the way to go for you. A partnership is an unincorporated association of two or more persons to pursue a business for profit as co-owners. The first step to building a successful partnership is to find a business partner that shares both your vision and your enthusiasm. Most importantly, you need to find a partner or partners that click with who you are and who you can also trust. However, just because you trust a partner doesn't mean you should hand them over the keys to your financial security, which is why it's important that the accounting for partnerships is done correctly just in case things don't work out the way you expect them to. In this lesson, we'll discuss general characteristics of partnerships and the accounting principles that help make the partnership a success. This includes how to start a new partnership, how to expand the partnership to including additional partners, and how to eventually dissolve the partnership should things not work out the way you plan. Partnerships have specific characteristics. They include voluntary association, a written partnership agreement, the limited life of the partnership, partners are taxed on their income, not the business itself, there's mutual agency, and unlimited liability, and most importantly, co-ownership of the property. Meet Zane. Zane owns a skateboard and snowboarding shop called Boards. After being in business for a year, Zane has discovered that while business is good, the combination of long hours and keeping up with the business is starting to take its toll. He decides that it's a good idea to find a partner for the business. Meet Perez. Perez is a loyal customer and Zane's best friend. Perez is also a professional skateboarder who recently had to leave the sport due to a knee injury. Perez has a strong work ethic and a vast knowledge of product, and Zane believes that his friend would bring a lot to the business. Zane puts up his existing storefront, worth $33,000, but has a $10,000 mortgage on it. Plus, he puts up $7,000 cash. Perez is able to contribute $10,000 cash, but nothing more. The total investment into the business is $40,000. Here are the journal entries. Zane puts up $7,000 cash, plus he puts up the store location valued at $33,000 but has a $10,000 mortgage on it. So we debit $7,000 cash, but we also debit the facility itself. We credit the mortgage as a note payable, which reduces Zane's capital contribution to $30,000. Next we have Perez. He contributes $10,000 cash but has nothing else to contribute. So we debit cash and credit Perez's capital contribution. As we can see, Zane and Perez do not have an equal share of the business since their capital contributions are not the same. This is normal. Rarely are partnerships formed where each partner owns an equal share of the business. In addition, it is also rare that partners will agree to do equal amounts of work in order to get the business to thrive. Therefore, the division of income and or losses must be spelled out in the partnership contract. In the allocation of stated ratios, income or losses are divided equally among the partners as per a predetermined ratio. In the allocation of capital balances, the percentage of the business each partner owns determines the income or loss allocation. That way, if a partner decides to withdraw 10% of their capital for the business for whatever reason, their allocation will also be reduced by 10%. In the allocation of services, capital, and stated ratios, this is more complex but more fair. Allocation is based on how much time or service is given to the business, as well as the amount of capital invested, with a minimum stated ratio is also added as a final backstop. So let's see how all this works. According to the partnership contract for boards, Zane and Perez made the following decisions. Zane would receive a salary of $36,000 and Perez would receive $24,000. Both partners would receive a 10% return on their capital investment into the business. Any extra income or loss would be equally divided among the partners. In this particular scenario, the extra $6,000 income is divided equally between the two partners and they are responsible for paying all the taxes on that income as an individual and not business income. 
In this next slide, we see what happens when allowances exceed income. In this particular case, the business lost $14,000, and the shortfall is divided equally among the two partners, which reduces their overall capital contribution. The balance sheet and income statement for a partnership are similar to with any other kind of business. The only major difference is the statement of owner's equity is replaced by a statement of partner's equity, which is what we'll concentrate on now. This slide shows us the statement of partner's equity after the first year of business. So what does it tell us? It tells us that income exceeded allowances by $6,000. Zane withdrew $20,000 of capital from the business prior to the reporting period, and Perez withdrew $12,000. The ending equity value of the company is $78,000. After their first year in business together, business has not been better. In fact, both partners have seen their initial capital contributions increase significantly. Unfortunately, with the store being as busy as it is, Zane and Perez are seriously considering bringing on a third partner. Perez suggests bringing in his brother-in-law, Rashid. After meeting Rashid, Zane agrees, but the only question now is how much will they ask their new partner to contribute to the business in order to seal the deal? In any case, the old partnership of Zane and Perez has been dissolved, and a new partnership agreement needs to be drawn up, which includes Rashid as the new partner. In this first scenario, Rashid enters the partnership by purchasing half of the shares from Perez. In this case, we debit Perez's investment by $13,000 and credit Rashid's investment by the same amount. In the statement of partner's equity, Rashid is added to the two other partners with a capital balance that is equal to Perez. In this second scenario, instead of purchasing a portion of Perez's interest in the partnership, Rashid decides to join the partnership by investing a flat $22,000 directly into the enterprise. On the statement of partner's equity, Rashid is added, but Perez's $26,000 investment is still intact, and Rashid's investment is now being shown. Yet another possibility is that Zane and Perez agree to admit Rashid as a 25% partner only if he invests $42,000. The additional funds resulting from the transaction will add to the capital investment of the two original partners. Rashid's equity is calculated as follows. Existing equity equals $78,000, plus the investment of new partner, $42,000, with a total partnership equity of $120,000. 25% of $120,000 is $30,000, which would be Rashid's portion of the equity. On the statement of partner's equity, Rashid is added, and we see that Zane and Perez's equity increases by $6,000 each, and we also see Rashid's $30,000 for a total equity of $120,000. Finally, let's assume that Zane and Perez need to convince Rashid to join their partnership by offering him an additional stake in addition to his original investment. They still want Rashid as a 25% partner, but only require that he invests $18,000. Rashid's equity is calculated as follows. Existing equity is $78,000 plus the investment of a new partner, which is $18,000, equals a total partnership equity of $96,000. 25% of ninety-six dollars is $24,000. And so on the statement of partner's equity, Rashid is added, and we see that Zane and Perez's equity then decreases by $3,000 each, and Rashid's equity at 25% is $24,000 for a total investment of $96,000. Okay, two years have gone by with the partnership of Zane, Perez, and Rashid. Things are going great, as each partner's investment in the business is really starting to pay off. But now Perez's old injury is healed, and he wants to get back to competing professionally. And this means that he'll need to leave the partnership in order to devote all of his time to training. Since Perez has a significant stake in the business, letting him go is not going to be easy. In fact, many partnerships fail completely when only one of the partners decides to leave. In order to prevent that from happening, Zayn and Rashid have to handle the loss of a key partner very carefully. The easiest way to do this is Perez can sell his interest to one or both of the partners. We simply debit the withdrawing partner's capital account and we credit the existing partner's capital account. Another option is to pay Perez cash or other assets equal to the amount of the investment that he has in the business. This can be done by granting him a bonus to the withdrawing partner or with no bonus. 
If there's no bonus, and we're simply paying Perez cash to leave the partnership, we debit Perez's capital account and credit cash. In terms of the balance sheet, we see a deduction in assets and a deduction in equity. Let's assume that Zane and Rashi don't want Perez to leave because they think that losing him will cost the business more than simply his capital contribution. So in order to convince the other partners to let him go, Perez agrees to grant a $2,000 bonus to each of the remaining partners. In the journal entry, we debit Perez's capital, credit cash for $34,000, and credit the capital of both Zane and Rashid. Now let's assume that Zane and Rashid want to reward Perez for his contribution, or perhaps they want to give him an incentive to leave. They do this by giving him an extra $2,000 bonus as he leaves. In the journal entry, we'll be debiting Perez's capital, credit cash for $40,000, and debit the capital for both Zane and Rashid because that bonus is actually coming out of their capital contributions. Unfortunately, when a partner dies, the partnership itself also dies. Assuming that the deceased partner doesn't specify in his will that his capital contribution will be distributed to the remaining partners, the estate is entitled to it. In a partnership contract, specific instructions are necessary in order to settle the estate of a deceased partner. For the sake of argument, let's assume that Perez did not leave the partnership and three years have gone by, and now the three partners have all decided they want to leave the partnership. They want to hang it up, close shop, and move on to other things in their lives. Provided that the net worth of the business is greater than its debts, all the partners can expect to benefit from the liquidation of the business. If the business debts are greater, though, than the value of the assets, then each partner will be personally responsible for the payment of those debts. The first step after closing the business is to allocate all assets and liabilities based on the partnership agreement. The second step is to liquidate all non-cash assets and then distribute the proceeds of the liquidation based on the partnership agreement. The third step is to pay off all the business's creditors and the last step is to distribute all the remaining cash to the partners again according to their capital account balances. In the event that there is no capital deficiency all three partners will walk away with cash in their pockets. Journal number one clears all outstanding debts of the business. Journal number two distributes the remaining cash to the partners. Also included is the impact on the balance sheet. In these next two scenarios, we are going to assume that Rashid has a capital deficiency. In other words, the encumbrances of the business exceed his capital contribution. In journal number one, we see him contributing $3,000 of his personal funds into the business in order to cover the capital deficiency. Then in journal two, we distribute the cash to the remaining partners. So what happens if Rashid cannot pay his capital deficiency? Then Zane and Perez will be on the hook for whatever Rashid owns to the business. So in this case, we show journal number one having the redistribution of the outstanding debt to the remaining capital accounts to Zane and Perez. Then journal number two shows the distribution of the remaining cash that's sitting in the capital accounts. So in conclusion, starting your own business is hard enough. Starting it with another person can make it easier, but it can also make it harder if your partner turns out to be less than what you thought they would be. Therefore, the keys to a successful partnership are First, find a partner who shares your passion and enthusiasm for the business that you want to build. If one partner is gung-ho and the other one is mm, lukewarm on the idea, the more enthusiastic partner is going to end up doing most of the work and resenting the other one. Write up a partnership agreement where everything is spelled out. This cannot be emphasized enough, but it's the most overlooked detail when people start a partnership. Be flexible. Each year, you and your partners need to sit down and review the partnership agreement. Oftentimes, a partnership agreement is out of date and needs to be changed on an annual basis. Most importantly, have fun. Running your own business can be the most difficult job that you've ever had, and if you don't absolutely love what you're doing for both yourself and your customers, you'll either burn out, go out of business, or both. I'm William G., and thank you very much for your attention.